I am sure that there is something in this reading meant just for you. This is the 38th chapter titled Motherhood, even for a sannyasi, even for someone who has taken sannyas. Renunciation. May this reading relax your mind and inspire your heart. I need a baby. I have to have a baby. I half begged, half panted. It was 2002 and I was 31. I had been celibate since my experience on Ganga, the holy river, six years earlier, even while I was still married to Jim, before I had realized our marriage was really over, I couldn't have sex anymore. Having been touched by something that permeated and filled me so much more deeply, my interest in sex was gone. When desire did rise up in the years that followed, typically unexpectedly, catching me so off guard that I almost didn't recognize it, I practiced the meditation that Puja Swamiji, my guru, had taught me, allowing the energy to rise within me rather than clamor to be released. The initial urge is for climax and release, but yogis and sages practicing austere celibacy along with fasting and silence tapped into the energetic channels and chakras of the body so perceptibly that they realized that this energy has three potential outlets. One, of course, is sexual release. The second is repression. It's simply pushed down and suppressed, like the pressurized containers we used in physics lab. But how much pressure can be exerted in a closed environment before it starts leaking out the corners, or if the box is airtight, explodes in an eruption of fiery fury? As so many of the masters of both spirituality and human psychology emphasize, we cannot suppress aspects of ourselves without having them leak out or explode like volcanoes. So option number two doesn't really work. And it leads to frustration, restlessness and belligerence as the building pressure escapes out the sides. Yogis and sages in their intense spiritual practice developed a third option. Recognizing the energy, welcoming it, neither denying nor repressing it, but containing it within the body. So, on the thankfully rare occasions when sexual desire would visit, I learned to sit down wherever I was, closed my eyes, put my hands on my heart, and used my breath to carry the energy upward into my heart and then into my third eye. If I could keep my mind on the practice rather than on the object of desire, in a few moments my heart would begin to pulsate beneath my hands as the energy literally seemed to fill it. As time went on, I learned to carry the energy even higher to the third eye called the Agna Chakra. As I brought this energy of desire for communion and connection up to the energy center of divine sight, I could feel it tingle under my skin and begin to expand, even though my physical senses were closed. By the time I opened my eyes, whatever I saw was infused with divinity, and I felt physically, energetically, and spiritually connected to everything around me. The urge for release of the self into a communion with another got transformed into an experience of communion with all. This meditation usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes, although sometimes I had to do it two or three times if the object of desire continued to appear in front of me. So, 
through a grace that I had neither earned, worked, expected, or even requested, most of the desire dissipated of its own accord, and my meditation was able to take care of the rest. That took care of desire for physical connection, but I hadn't anticipated the power of the hormonal urge to propagate. While I was firm in my vows of celibacy, I needed a baby. Every time I saw a baby, my head would spin, pulled like iron to a magnet, my eyes glued to its pink cheeks. Baby. I need a baby. The cells of my body were screaming. Maybe some of you can resonate with this. So finally, I told Buddha Swamiji, my guru, I need a baby. You what? He asked. A baby. I have to have a baby, Swamiji. I am going crazy. He looked at me and laughed. Okay, no problem. It happens. You should do whatever makes you happy. You do not have to stay as a sannyasi if that isn't what you want. If you say, I will find someone for you to marry. We can find you a nice Indian boy. No, Swamiji, I moaned. I don't want to get married. I don't want to give up being a sannyasi. I don't want to have sex. I just need a baby. He looked at me as though he might be thinking, and who is the scientist around here? Anyway, he said, amused and perhaps exasperated by the problem I had presented. You decide. If you want to get married, no problem. You can stop being a sannyasi. Just tell me what you want. I investigated the possibility of adoption, but was informed that no adoption center would give a child to an unmarried for foreign woman living in an ashram. <laughs> Also, I realized that the vows of sannyas probably forbid me to legally adopt a child. The waves came and went. Weeks would go by when this desire simply didn't arrive, and then I'd be in an airport or in the arti and see a mother holding her child, and the wave would rise and drown me. A baby. I need a baby my body would scream into my brain. God will provide you. Buja Swamiji always reminds people, whatever the need, whatever the lack, whatever the concern, Swamiji's answer is the same. God will take care. God will give you what you really need. He frequently shares stories of his days in the jungle, in need of a candle, when suddenly, out of nowhere, a villager would appear at his hut or along the road, candle in hand, and say, Here, I thought you could use a candle. God, in Pujya Swamiji's personal experience, is not only the provider of life, but also the provider of the smallest things we need to sustain life. Amusing, of course, that we're deeply connected to him and that what we ask for is in accord with our highest unfolding and awakening. Assuming, of course, that I say amusing. Well, it's also amusing. So, as I frequently remind people in satsang, in the fellowship of spiritual seekers, God is not a vending machine who gives us what we want or think we paid for. Rather, he gives us what we need, including candles for devotees during intense sadhana in the forest. And babies? In November of that year, I was walking on the long flat gut on the edge of the Ganga after the Ardi. It's nearly the size of a football field, a place for thousands to sit and meditate, barefoot and silent on the cool marble platform in the chilly night air, I walked as an evening ritual, a time of personal meditation, silently chanting my mantra with each step, the only noise that of the waves crashing on the steps. Suddenly, a young man approached me excitedly. 
He was in his late twenties or early thirties and had two tiny boys with him. One of his arms, uh, one in his arms and one hanging onto his finger. How can I put my children into your Gurukul? He asked. In 2000, we opened the Gurukul at Paramarth, a project Pujya Swamiji had dreamed about for many years. It's a free residential program for orphaned, poor, and disadvantaged boys, and they receive shelter, food, and education, academic and traditional Vedic education, including sacred rites and rituals, scriptural study, Sanskrit, and more. Initially, we envisioned it only for orphans, but it quickly grew to include anyone who needed to be there, anyone whose parents could not fully and properly care for them. The Rishi Kumars, the boys at the Gurukal, wore yellow dhoti and kurtas, the traditional outfit of religious men and priests. They led the rituals of the Ardi, sat in front and sang rapturously. Many who came to the Ardi shared how touched they were by watching these boys' face in ecstasy, these boys' faces in ecstasy. This young gentleman repeated himself his fair skin flushed with excitement. It is so beautiful to see these young children singing so divinely. Please, will you accept my children? I want them to receive the same opportunity for such a divine life. Where are you from? I asked. A small village about an hour from the city of Jammu, he said. It is far, but I came here because there is a Gita Bhavan temple branch in our local village and I knew they have a branch in Rishikesh, so I came here with my children in search of a better life for them. When I saw these young boys singing and chanting so beautifully and I saw the smiles on their faces and the glow on Pujya Swamiji's face, I knew this is the right place for them. I looked at the two tiny children with him. Our Gurukul accepts five and six-year-olds. We don't have the infrastructure for those who need assistance going to the bathroom, bathing or brushing their teeth. These children looked too young. He is too, the man responded to my unasked question, nodding toward the young boy in his arms, and she is four. The child on the end of his fingers had black hair cut close to her face and wore the same grey shirt, black pants and solemn expression as her brother. They had both appeared to be boys. I am so sorry, I said. Two is much too young and our Gurukul doesn't take girls. We are planning to hopefully open one for girls soon, but at the moment we have only boys. However, if you stay here and they stay with you, then I am sure we can arrange for her to study in the Gurukul in the day and stay with you in the night. He was ecstatic. This is a dream come true, he gushed. I will do whatever seva you say, whatever selfless service. I cannot believe we are so fortunate, so blessed to be able to stay in such a holy place. Each day they came and spent time in my office. The father, Rameshwar, gushed effusively about his joy of being there and the possibility of a better life for his children, free from the difficulties they faced in their home and village. The two children were mostly silent and stoic. Slowly, I began to get a half smile from the young girl, Shivani. As the days turned into a week, she began to crawl into my lap as soon as they entered my office, feeling somehow entitled to occupy that space and push onto the keys of my keyboard, clearly a device she'd never seen. Tap, tap, tap. She would push. When I drew her attention to the monitor to show her how what she had tapped was appearing on the screen, her mouth opened wide and she exclaimed, Ah! Daddy, come see. And she tapped and tapped, pointing to the monitor. 
She couldn't, of course, read, but simply the fact that this device responded to her taps in such an obedient way thrilled her to no end. From then on, I had to make sure to close out all programs I was working in whenever she entered my office, because, inevitably, if I merely took a breath or a sip of water or sneezed, she would tap tap, push push, wrecking havoc on any document or file. But it was worth it. As she sat in my lap, folding her legs between mine, tapping the keys and touching everything with an arm's reach, I knew I loved her. And they had been at the ashram, after they had been at the ashram for about a week, Rameshwar came in one day and he said he needed to go back to Jammu. His wife had found out where he was through connections between their local Gita Bhavan center and the one next to our ashram, and she insisted he return home. He was a clerk in a local government office, and government jobs are hard to come by. Even in a small town, as a clerk, the perks and benefits outweigh any other potential employment. To lose that opportunity at such a young age would not be wise. I will take Shivam back with me, he explained, as he is so young. Pardon me, I cannot, I can protect him and care for him properly. But I am worried about Shivani. I cannot properly care for her. Can she stay here with you all? The ashram is filled with hundreds of permanent residents, elderly widows, retired householders, and young seekers who are more eager to delve into the depths of spiritual practice than into married life, fill ashram rooms and pathways, and meditate on benches in the sunshine. There was a young woman living at the ashram at the time named Vasuda, who had come from a city on the outskirts of Delhi. She was in her early twenties, well educated and cultured, and spent her days in prayer, meditation and worship. Of a small image of Lord Krishna she had installed in her room, she would be perfect to care for Shivani as she had the time and the youthful energy as well as the culture and values needed to raise a young girl. I spoke with Pooja Swamiji and he agreed, given the circumstances of Shivani's home situation, that despite her father having to return, she could stay and Vasudha would be perfect to care for her. However, at the moment, Vasudha was away for a few days, it was Kartik Purnima, the full moon of the month of Kartik, which falls during October and November and is very ho holy for worshippers of Lord Krishna. She had gone to Vrindavan, the city where Lord Krishna had lived, to dance and pray in the moonlight, as the gopis, the milkmaidens, had danced with Krishna on the same night so many thousands of years ago. No problem, I told Rameshwar. She can stay with me for a night or two until Vasudha returns. His eyes filled with tears as he bowed low to touch my feet in gratitude. I cannot believe how God has sent you to us, he said. When the time came for him to leave, Shivani barely noticed. Tap tap, push push on the keys of my computer. Amid the giggles, there was a bye as he walked out the door, Shivam in his arms, to catch the train back to Jammu. Shivani spent that night in my bed. She didn't begin there, as my room has two single beds and she had her own. However, a few hours into the night, she awoke with a start and began crying. Ow, ow, come, come, I said. She crawled into my bed, still crying in her sleep. The single beds at the ashram are not like single beds anywhere I'd ever been, although the ones in my Stanford dorm were close. These beds are so small that an obese American would spill out over the edges. They are definitely not beds for two. But when one has a four-year-old crying in the night, Practical matters are secondary. 
She curled up into my body as I held her, her heart beating through her bony back into my hands. I drifted into short, into sweet, albeit short-lived sleep. Shivani's legs had uncurled and were now attempting to push their way through my abdomen. She had a knee in my ribs, then a foot in my belly button, then an elbow in my chin. I turned her over onto the other side and held her close from behind, lest she pushed her way out of the bed. However, her kicks were remarkably adaptable, as now her legs flailed backward, heels planted firmly into my stomach. It was a sleepless but blissful night as I held this beautiful gift of life in my arms. In the morning, I filled the bucket in my bathroom with warm water and picked up her wriggling naked body. No, no, she giggled and shrieked, pulling her legs tight into her body like a turtle, lest her toes touch the water. It's nice and warm, I explained. She didn't understand. Her home must not have had a hot water geyser. I took her hand and gently put her fingers in the bucket. Her eyes lit up. Warm water. She raised her arm so I could lift her and place her into the bucket, bottom first, with her calves dangling over the edge. One plastic bucket, a few gallons of warm water, a bar of soap. These were the only ingredients necessary to turn my small bathroom into her own personal Disneyland. She laughed and yelped and splashed, scooping water out and throwing it on her face and head. I put a, a bit of shampoo into the palms of my hands and began to wash her hair. Her arms continued to toss handfuls of soapy water into the air and now into my face as I bent low to shampoo her hair. I filled jugs of water to rinse it, but as I brought each jug close to her head, her hand shot up to block it. No, no, she was not ready to be rinsed off yet. She was not ready to abandon her soapy paradise. <laughs> Later that afternoon, Vasudha returned from Vrindavan, and I explained the situation. She happily agreed to the seva of caring for Shivani. I introduced her to Shivani and explained to Shivani that she would be staying with Vasudha from now on. She could come visit me, of course, whenever she wanted, but she was to stay with Vasudha. She let Vasudha take her by the hand out of my office and back into her room. However, at 10.30 that night, there was a knock on my door. I had not slept the night before due to the kicking of my beloved bedmate, and I was just getting into bed. I went to the door, and there stood a harried Vasudha, a harried Vasudha. Harried? Does this mean she's covered in hair? I don't know. A harried Vasudha with a screaming Shivani in her arms. She will only sleep with you, Didi, Vasudha said in English. I tried. Didi is the Hindi term for older sister and is used respectively, or respectfully on its own or as a suffix. Shivani leapt from Vasudha's arms and passed me into my room. Kya hua? What happened? I asked Vasudha. She was fine all afternoon and evening, she replied. She played nicely in my room and even ate her supper. But when I tried to put her down to bed, she started crying and she said she would only sleep with you. I have spent the last hour trying to calm her down and sleep, but she will not. I don't know what to do. I am sorry. Don't worry, I assured her. Get some sleep and we'll sort this out tomorrow. I walked back into my room to find Shivani asleep, sprawled across my bed. For many months, she lived with me, slept in my bed, bathed in my bucket, burrowed her way deep into my identity and existence. She went to school at the free day school we run for children of the ashram, as well as local children in need of education. In the afternoon, she played with Rishi Kumars, 
I bought her yellow bottoms to match the boys' dhotis, and she wore the same yellow kurta top. She sat on the floor of my office, a small individual dining table as her desk, coloring, cutting, and eating peanuts and popcorn. Each evening at the arti, she lined up with the Rishi Kumars at the very front of the line to escort my guru, Puja Swamiji, down to the river bank. In the arti, she sat as near to Puja Swamiji as possible, watching him closely out of the corner of her eye as she mimicked every motion. When he sang, raising his arms into the air ecstatically, she too threw her arms into the air. She swayed when he swayed, clapped when he clapped, and sang only his portion of the call in response. Alone in my office, she would repeat the full rendition of the arti, now free to go beyond accompanying Puja Swamiji and actually be him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, she bellowed, her body leaning dramatically first left, then right. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. She threw her arms into the air, eyes closed, pumping the sky with her palms. One evening, in January, at the peak of winter cold, I stayed back in my office during the arti, finishing up some work. A few months after, Puja Swamiji left to walk down to the Ganga, flanked by rows of yellow-clad Rishi Kumars, led on one side by my adopted daughter, I noticed she had forgotten her shawl in the office. The sun was setting, and it would be fifty degrees and dark by the time the Ardi finished. I grabbed the maroon wool shawl, identical to the ones the Rishi Kumars wore, and rushed after her, sprinting down the main ashram pathway in my bare feet. But they were too far ahead and were already descending the steps to Ardi by the time I reached the main gate. Despondent and bewildered, I stood there imagining icicles hanging from her short hair, her lips blue and body frigid. Suddenly, I began to laugh. The sun was setting on the opposite side of the river, the last rays of light dancing in Mother Ganga's waters. The opening stanza of the Hanuman Chalisa had begun, and the old lady sitting on the benches lining the pathway beside me began to sing along. Here I was. I laughed, a white-robed sannyasi, a celibate renunciate, racing anxiously, woolens in hand after a four-year-old girl lest she catch cold near the river. I had become a mother after all. Who is she? People asked, as it was unusual to see a small Indian child on the end of the pinky finger of an American nun. She's my daughter, I responded. Should anyone need to verify it, I would ask her. Tum kiski ho? Whose are you? She would look up at me and smile. Apki, yours. Several months later, in the spring, her father returned along with Shivani's mother. Swamiji spent several days counseling them, trying to bring peace into a marriage pervaded by abuse and blame. No! Shivani cried, flinging herself flat like a pancake on the wall of my office when they tried to take her back to Jammu. As they tried, one after the other, to peel her from the wall, she sank down in a limp puddle of tears. No, I don't want to go. She cried my tears as well, for I had to keep my face dry. I had to be the adult here and do the right thing. Of course, any child would be better off with her mother and father, regardless of their circumstances, rather than living in an ashram with someone as busy as I am. I reasoned to myself, that is what's best for her. I repeated as a mantra in my own mind, staving off despair at how God could so cruelly grab back the gift he'd given us both so lovingly. You'll come back very soon, my love, I told her, breathing as deeply as I could to keep my voice from cracking. Biju, 
One of the young men living in Seva at the ashram threw her limp, sobbing body gently over his shoulder and carried her to the rickshaw that would take her family to the train station. Maya kaha chalegi? Where has Maya gone? Pooja Swamiji asked me later that day. Her name is Shiv. I began to correct him and then stopped suddenly. My words froze in my throat. Maya is the Sanskrit word for illusion. It's used to refer not to literal optical illusions like the mirage of water in the desert, but to that hypnotic power that wraps its veil around our inner eye, convincing us that the transitory is permanent, that the form is content, that the physical world is real. Maya is that which keeps people living life only on the outermost level, the veil that prevents us from seeing the truth. God has given this opportunity, he continued, not merely for you to give the gift of love to a child, but also for you to experience the bonds of attachment and how to break through them to the truest, highest love. He looked at me and shook his head with a gentle disappointment. So far, you have learned only how to be attached and how to give love out of your own attachment. Go beyond this. Learn to love without requiring her physical body in your lap all the time. Learn to love bigger than just feeding her peanuts and popcorn. Shivani returned before the heat of summer, brought by her father into my open arms. We are so blessed, he said, that she has you, that we have you. For the next several years, she traveled back and forth between Rishikesh and Jammu, spending most of her time in Rishikesh whenever I wasn't traveling abroad. Shivani's parents responded to this new turn of events in Shivani's life with gratitude and deference deference to my role as a religious leader and to my background academically, economically and culturally, and effusive gratitude for the inexplicable blessing their young daughter was receiving. Their own personal circumstances and the difficulties therein occupied most of their mind and attention anyway. I tried not to let my tears of joy show upon her arrival, nor my tears of sorrow upon her departure. I tried to focus each day on loving her essence, not only her form, of loving the divine content of her being. As I held her tiny body in my arms at night while she kicked her way to sleep, I focused on loving her soul, on expanding my own love from the confines of the heart and my chest to my own boundless soul. This gently snoring being and I merged into an ocean of love where there was no place she ended and I began. A few years later, when her front teeth fell out, I could focus only on how cute she was. I couldn't look at her without laughing joyously. Then her permanent teeth grew in and I could again focus on loving her soul. Our years together passed in much the same way as a normal parent slash child relationship. Minus, thankfully, any teenage rebellion. I sent her to a high-end all-girls boarding school about two years from Rishikesh. Sorry, two hours from Rishikesh. My goodness, that'd be a long, a long travel. <laughs> about two hours from Rishikesh in the city of Dehradun the famous former British Hill Station with schools that count former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi among their alumni. In India, students are required to choose their academic path much sooner than we are in the West. I remember letters I got during my third year at Stanford that began, Dear Undeclared Junior, and proceeded to give me a deadline by which I needed to make a decision sometime during the junior year of college. In India, 
From tenth grade on, the streams separate. Science or humanities or commerce. Humanities and commerce are the common choices. Science is, as I remember from college days, chosen only by the crazy few who are a driven enough to truly live, breathe, breathe, eat, and sleep schoolwork for the next God knows how many years of life, and b endowed with the ability and intelligence to speak the language of numbers foreign to the rest of us. I excelled in math in high school and on standardized tests, scoring near the 100th percentile on my SAT math and having completed college-level advanced placement math in high school, I expected to walk into freshman math at Stanford and continue to excel, except that I couldn't understand a word the teacher said. Is this the right class? I wondered. Alas, it was, and I quickly realized I would need to take it pass slash fail rather than for a grade. To pass in itself would be a miracle. Those who stayed in the sciences were those I believed to be masochistic, <laughs> unbelievably dedicated, or outrageously gifted, none of which was I. But now my daughter wanted to do science. Out of her class of about twenty students, only two chose science. What do you want to do as a scientist? I asked her. Go into outer space, Shivani said. Oh my god, I thought. I've raised an astronaut. Do you like physicals lab? I asked. No. Do you like chemistry lab? No. Do you realize that astronauts spend much, much, much more of their time in laboratories than in outer space? Oh. Her face fell. Well, then I will do computers. I like computers. Still, science. Are you sure? I asked. I tried to stay present with my commitment to support and nourish her every step of the way and to make sure she knew that all doors of life were open to her. Just because she had come from a village, just because her family wasn't well educated, there was no reason she could not reach the stars. I had been emphasizing this since she was four years old. However, her grades were fine, but not fantastic. She consistently scored well above average, but not at the top. She was not born an academic. Or she was not a born academic. One day she told me, My biology professor is crazy. He expects us to learn too much. I mean, okay, there is a cell, then inside the cell there are so many things, then inside that there is a nucleus, inside the nucleus there are so many things, and then inside that, and inside that, and inside that, doesn't it end? How much can we really learn? <laughs> she had to reaffirm her commitment to science in her 10th and then 12th class exams. I continued to open doors for her, as every time we spoke, her only stress was her science classes. Are you sure you wanted to do science? You want to do science? If not, there are many other possibilities open for you. She was always sure. She was even sure when, having been so confident that she would get into one of the top science institutes in the country, one of the Indian Institutes of Technology, with a cutoff at the 99.97 percentile, she applied nowhere else. When she didn't get in, but received offers to study humanities or commerce at other universities, she turned them down and enrolled instead in an intense year-long computer course to prepare for retaking the science exams the following year. In the debate of nature versus nurture and child development, I think they left out a third variable. Whether you call it karma, destiny, or out of the blue greatness, not everything can be explained by nature, nurture, or the overlap between them. Shivani's academic tenacity, 
her willingness to stay awake night after night studying, to take not what came easily but what needed to be worked for, was not in her DNA or her home or ashram environment. It grew in fertile soil that seemed to be from another garden altogether, one I had never visited but marveled at constantly. She excelled in her exams the second time around, got her first choice of campus and degree, and has now completed her Bachelor of Technology (BTech) degree in Software Engineering and has been hired by a well-reputed multinational company. As nearly all marriages in India are still arranged by the parents, I find my mind floating toward young men her age I know who would make good spouses in a few years. In a recent... Oh, I will have to wait for my connection to return. My apologies. I think my internet is connected for just a moment. If it has returned, do let me know. And I wish to continue where I left off. <laughs> As nearly all marriages in India are still arranged by the parents, I find my mind floating toward young men her age. I know who would make good spouses in a few years. In a recent conversation, we were discussing her parents, who finally, albeit temporarily, took some time apart from each other after decades of mutual abuse. They both called us frequently and begin their conversations asking whether we'd heard from the other. Has he called you? Has she called you? Shivani said to me during that time, I've told my mother that I will not answer that question because it is of no benefit to her to know whether he has called. It has no relevance to her life and she should not be asking things like that. She needs to get herself involved in some good work because she overthinks everything and this causes her to suffer. She said it very casually. We had been laughing about the silliness of them splitting up, only to constantly try to monitor each other's actions. We were chatting about her upcoming internship. She did not warn me that she was going to make a brilliant spiritual pronouncement. She did not say, sit down, because this is really going to excite you. She just said it as though it were the most obvious thing in the world. Of course, to me, it was. <laughs> to me, at 46, having dedicated nearly half of my life to spiritual practice, this was obvious. But to her, at 19, at 19, I had my head in toilets, throwing up Twix bars and Hagen das as a poor substitute for throwing up feelings that could not be felt. I am so proud of you, was all I could muster, my voice choking with gratitude for the gift of mothering this incredible being. Thank you for listening. That is the end of the 38th chapter, from Hollywood to the Himalayas. What an extra special chapter as we go through reading this journey of Dear Sadhvi Bhagavati Saraswati. This was one of the longer chapters and clearly one of great significance in her life, as it definitely should be. I love that she had a chance to be a mother, even while being a renunciate. It goes to show that you really can be both. And what a beautiful story of Shivani as she grew up to be a very successful, smart, and wise young woman. How lovely that is. Very grateful to be able to read this with you all, and we'll continue reading next time.